Turn it over to him. Well, I guess Josh already said who I am. Who I am. Yeah. Actually, you don't care who I am, just what I have to say, right? Right? Yeah, yeah. yeah excellent. <coughs> so I'm going to talk to you about the structured data types in Postgres. Actually, I was calling them unstructured data types. I can't make up my mind whether to call them structured or unstructured, because compared to SQL, they're unstructured. But internally, they're structured, just not consistently. Anyway, you don't care. So in Postgres, there are several different types of, stru of uh, structured data that are supported. XML, HStore, JSON, and new and 94 any day now, is JSONB. <clears throat> So what I want to do in this talk is talk about which ones you should use, when should you use them, and why you want to use them. So a brief tour, not not three hours. <clears throat> Four. <laughs> I actually hadn't done a whole lot with XML and Postgres before I started preparing this talk a few months ago, and uh, I discovered it's actually pretty interesting. Uh, XML support was added in Postgres 8.2. There's a data type, uh, and it supports publishing, data exports, uh, SQL 2003 conformance, which is pretty awesome, and an XPath uh, functionality. So the implementation uh, does data validation. So when you insert an XML data type, it validates that it's valid XML before it lets it be inserted. The value is stored in its text representation. It's not converted to any sort of internal representation. It's purely text. Therefore, there are no comparison operators between XML values. Therefore, there's no indexing of in XML values. However, you can cast an XML value to text if you need to do uh, similarity, or not similarity, excuse me, comparisons. Or better still, use the XPath functionality. Hi, Gab. Hi. Sorry, Mike. You're that guy in the front row. <laughs> there are a whole slew of XML generation functions in Postgres. Uh, XML element will create an XML element. XML attributes allows you to create one or more attributes of an element. Uh, XML comment and XML concat allow you to add um, comments in your XML or to concatenate XML values. So here's a quick example in which uh, we're using nested calls to these functions. So we're creating, oh, I don't have to, right here. We're creating an XML element named foo. It has an attribute named bar with a value of XYZ. Nested in it is an attribute named ABC. We have a comment. We have another element with the name of XYZ and that has an in embedded element of yak with a value of Barber. And it just creates this nice XML string here. So it's pretty nice for composition. Pretty good functionality there. There are a number of predicates supported, including is document to validate that an XML value is a valid XML document. There's XML is well formed to make sure that your XML is good. The XML exists operator allows you to query an XML value. Use an XPath expression and pass it an XML value, and you can see if the value you're looking for exists in the XML. You guys all familiar with XPath? Hands up if you know a little bit of X. You know what it is. Okay. Only, that's, only from testing our XML type. That's good enough. <laughs> I yeah, I actually wrote a, a, a Perl module to test the structure of XML and, and um, HTML using XPath so you can write tests against it. So I actually had to learn a little bit of it a while ago. Uh, more explicitly, there's an XPath function. Again, you pass an XPath query expression to it and your XML. And what it does is it returns an array of all the values that were found for that query. So here I'm saying uh, under the P P element, there should be an LM element, and I want the text of it. So there's an A element here with the value of text, and the A element here with the text of me, and so we get back a SQL array with those values. Mm. Similarly, there's an XPath exists operator uh, where you can do the, the same thing. And 
you can pass, uh, it has the same interface, only it just returns a Boolean to tell you if it found something or not. I actually don't know exactly what the difference is between this function and the XPath exist function with no underscore, except I think the former takes a passing keyword and is SQL 2003 compliant, and this one is, uh, it just feels a little nicer to me. <clears throat> it does support namespacing in your XML in, in your queries. Here's kind of a cool function. You can call the query to XML function and pass it a string containing a SQL query, and it will turn the results into XML. So here, uh, I'm just selecting from PG class and, and rel namespace uh, to get a list of all the, what did I want? All the namespaces other than PG catalog, PG toast, and an information schema. So here, uh, we got one row that has uh, the public schema with a table name stuff and a public schema with a table named stuff p key, not a table, there's a primary key, and a public table with an index. So anyway, but just to be able to get your nested rows here, it's, it's kind of cool, and I think this is um, some sort of XML schema standard mm. that you can use. <clears throat> As for querying, you can get actually pretty complicated. So I'm setting up a quick little psql variable here called xpath containing this very long xpath expression so that the rest of my stuff will fit on the slides. I loaded up uh, one month's worth of US patent office grants applications. And among other things, it'll list the examiners who examined the grant application. <clears throat> and so we can get their last name as text, right? So when I loaded this up, uh, I'm performing a query here uh, where in the XML document, I'm passing this XPath and casting it to a text array. So I want to know all the, all the grants where Brooks and Rosa, sorry for my murdering of that Eastern European last name there, and there are four of them, getting it back as an array. But as you can yeah. see, it took 37 seconds to run this query, which is um, slow. So what we can do is index. This thing moves. <clears throat> so here I'm just calling uh, the XPath and passing the XPath to it on my XML doc. So remember, that's just getting an array of last names, and I'm casting it to an array of text, because you can't index an array of uh, XML that gets returned. I guess that returns. Return array of XML? I'm, I can't remember why I have to cast it as text. Anyway, this allows us to create a B-tree index on this, these array values for each row. So when I run the, the query again, you can see now we're less than a three quarters of a second. We're about three quarters of a second here on my MacBook Air here. So pretty, that's, that's a nice improvement. <clears throat> However, if we say, well, what if I want to know only those grants where Brooks was one of the examiners? I run this again, and I'm passing the same XPath uh, function here, but now I'm saying within any, right? And we're back to 40 seconds of runtime. So if previously I was indexing an array, but if we want to actually index scalar values, we can of course do that too. Here I'm gonna, this is the same XPath thing here I think. So here I'm uh, getting it and I'm just getting the first value in the array that's returned and indexing that or grabbing that. Uh, so this is the query you're gonna wanna run. So we can actually create an index on that casting it to text with that single value, <clears throat> getting just the first one. And now uh, we can execute this expression and we're down to just one millisecond. However, previously I had said any on this and I got what, the 30 something results, but now I'm getting only 12 because I'm only interested in getting the, looking to see if the primary examiner is Brooks. Each grant could have multiple examiners. <clears throat> I don't think I thought of that when I wrote this. I just thought of it now that <laughs> I was getting different results. Still, uh, once you're indexing scalar values, you can get quite good performance. But you have to know in advance, of course, the sorts of queries you're gonna be running against your XML. If you're always looking at the same uh, nested structure, you can get very, very good performance. But if you need to do arbitrary queries, you're gonna deal with table scans over large XML documents no matter what you do. 
So when do you use XML? You should use it when you have existing XML documents to deal with. <clears throat> like for example, if you have a SOAP API or XHTML that you want to load into your database because you're crazy. It has very good document storage. It's pretty, pretty efficient because it's just storing the text which compresses nicely. <clears throat> and therefore it has very fast I.O. And XPath I think is really awesome. It's a little arcane, uh, not as much as regular expressions, but I'm a regular expression user so I think it's cool. But of course the performance is best on index scalers or when table scans or iterating through large documents is okay with you. <clears throat> because we have a per row parsing overhead. Each XML you look at with your uh, XPath query has to parse the XML to do the expression. And God help you if you have two of these, you're saying where the primary or the secondary author equals to Brooks, then you're parsing the document twice. Mm. So those are the limitations with that. You can get around that to some degree with indexing values uh, where, where you know in advance that exactly the sorts of things you're interested in. So questions about XML? Sir? Is it doing any validation against a schema or a DTD? It does not. Is the, that, that's not our fault. Nobody has yet actually written an algorithm for DTD evaluate that, uh, validation of XML um, that works. It's been one of the big failures of XML as a, as a technology. If you'd like that, you should talk to Josh after the talk. He'll get you set up. In the back? A Google Summer Code student spent about a month and a half trying to get that to work and gave up. Oh, God. Has anybody tried an X query? I don't think there's X query support in Postgres, no. And I've never messed with X query. I mean, X path is a subset of X query, if I recall correctly. And I never had a need for anything that wasn't an X path. And I never, ever, ever wanted to write queries in XML. I don't even like to write HTML. So, yeah. yeah. So, do you think that native XML will ever happen in Postgres, or is that just, do you think XML will be gone by the time? I think this will stay. Right. There's no reason to remove it. And for managing documents, it's useful. And I think it's possible if you really needed something with a, a deeper kind of indexing, you could write a parser for uh, T-Search and get full text indexing of your HTML or XML documents. But I seriously doubt that anyone now will put in the effort to like create binary representations of XML, more efficient stuff, because there's stuff that's uh, slightly more popular. We'll get to shortly, yeah. So in real world applications, I presume what's going on is most people are extracting relevant metadata and storing it in conventional SQL columns and, yeah. on, and matching on metadata and then fetching the whole bulk of the document. Uh, yeah, I would think so. Or else using expression indexes with function <coughs> calls, which is, um, unless you need to like get a whole list of things, that's actually a more efficient way to, to, to go about it, but yes. Any, any, yeah. Regarding one of your functions, which converts into the XML, is, can it be customizable? Can the... Conversion from a, uh, the SQL query into an XML, which converts into like the row tag and all the other things, does it can be customizable? I'm sorry, I'm not... Can you show me the example which converts into the XML? Uh, go back. This one? No. I'm running a two episodes. Oh, oh, uh, yeah, there's some sort of, this one. Yes. Yeah, there's quite a bit of stuff you can do with this. I don't remember the details. As I said, I kind of started digging into the XML stuff in order to be complete in this presentation. I don't personally use it. But as I started to look at it, I was surprised at the amount of support there is for generating XML. And there are a couple of different ways to uh, dump XML. I think there's even a function to dump the schema as XML. Is there not, Josh? Uh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, um, it's pretty comprehensive. And so, yeah, there is stuff you can do to customize it, but I do not recall what they are. I'm sorry. So can you just be a list of columns and it renames them? Yes. So that would be... 
Yeah, you, anything you do in the query is what you'll end up with down, down here. And there are a couple of different, see these, these here, like this like turns on uh, the compact representation of XML schema and this one does, removes, no, I don't remember, but there, there are a few flags that give you different representations, different compactness. Um, and yeah, of course you can write this, the, the query to output whatever you want. Yeah, Josh. Um, if you have library support for it, there's also an extension PL XSLP, XLST. I never remember what, what order that acronym does in. Um, yes, XML uh, tran transformation language. Mm -hmm. um, which, so you can actually do transformations on the XML in Postgres. Uh, Peter, when we released XML, Postgres with XML, Peter Eisentraut wrote, um, use that to turn Postgres into the slowest web server in the world. <laughs> <laughs> well, you could actually send Postgres in an HTTP request wrapped in a function and it would return a, a web page. Yeah, there's plenty of evil to be done with it. But. Yeah? Just from a Post4G perspective. I'm sorry? From a Post4G perspective from this week, that would seem that if you actually stick a WPS service directly on your Postgres database and you respond directly rather than having yeah, I think it might be slow, but why would it be slower than the external product? I don't know. <laughs> Is it actually quite slow? The what? Well, what was the time on the query here? Uh, it's pretty fast. I mean, the. I think that most of the time is taken up for the query itself. I mean, this is a simple query. I only have a few tables in this test database. And then it's just doing formatting stuff. I think it's pretty sane, yeah. There's a lot more interest in XML here than I ever expected. Are you people nuts? <laughs> well, we did have, it, this is mostly thanks to a combination of Peter Eisenberg and two summers of the code. Uh-huh. Right, yeah. Yes? Could you inline a template? I believe that would probably be XSLT, for example, yeah. and not just you know, world to world web server. Right. But you know, <coughs> I, I would see it making sense if you output it to Apache FOP or directly producing uh, PDFs. Be useful. Huh. Yeah. I, I don't know. I, I was, as I said, I was kind of surprised at the abilities of what is there and I think there's probably all sorts of crazy shit you could do with it that never occur to me so but uh, don't ever use it <clears throat> so let's talk about HStore for a minute is this gonna work come on there we go the HStore extension was also added to the contrib modules in Postgres 8.2. It supports simple key value pairs. The keys and the values are only allowed to be strings. Uh, there are no nested values, only top level keys in this structure. But there are lots of very useful operators for, for, for dealing with it, plus uh, gist and gin indexing. In Postgres and I know there were a number of improvements with a bunch of new operators and functions, and B-tree and hash indexing was added. So the, an equality operator was added to compare to. And the capacity was increased. So I believe that you can have HStore as large as will fit into Toast, which is like two gigabytes or something. Don't do that. So here's how you use it. First, you have to load the extension. So we just call create extension HStore. Now we have all of its functionality within the database you've run this in. And the format is basically key value pairs separated by Perl style fat commas, right? So I'm just casting this to HStore. And it comes out that uh, keys and values are quoted with double quoted strings except for uh, numbers and um, I mean, I cast this, this is treated as a string here. But numbers and um, nulls, so a null, of course, is, is raw there. And this will translate to an SQL null. <clears throat> now, there are, as I said, there are a number of operators. So if you want to get the value of a single key, you use this arrow operator here. So I'm getting the user key from here, and so I'm getting back Fred. 
You can also pass in an array of values. I want to get the user and the ID. So we get back the user and the ID, Fred and ID1 here, as an array. <clears throat> A really cool operator is this containment operator. When you can say, does this hstore value contain this hstore value? Um, and it's not just saying, is, it, is the key there? But it can say, is the key with this value there? And that's what it looks up, and that's the result we get here. I should remember I have a pointer. Uh, among the many, many operators that are supported by the HStore extension is the concatenation operator, the key exists operator, which returns a Boolean, the keys exist operator, which uh, returns a Boolean if all the keys in the array you pass to it exist in the HStore. Do any of the keys exist? So again, pass in an array here. And if any of the keys in that array exist in the H store, it will return true. And you can delete a key or an array of keys from an H store by passing a, a text or array of text to this operator, and it will just remove them from the H store. You can also use this, this the funny double percent operator to convert an H store to an array, a SQL array. In addition to the operators, and there are lots more operators than those, but in addition to the operators, we have a bunch of functions. So there's the HStore constructor to which you pass two values, and it will create uh, a single key value pair, HStore value. You can even pass it uh, a table type or uh, a, a row type, and it will convert that to HStore as well. So you see here, even just passing a row with no column names or anything, it's not a, a composite data type. It just We'll name the first value F1 and the second value F2. And you can pass in an array of key value pairs and it will convert that into HStore key value pairs. <coughs> oh, did I say it supported numbers? It doesn't support numbers. It's just strings and nulls. Sorry. And you can't have a null as a key. Other functions. The A keys function returns an array of all the keys that are in your HStore value. The avals function returns an array of all the values in your hstore. You can convert hstore to JSON using the hstore to JSON function. I don't know how they came up with that name. Uh, so here I'm passing a key. Uh, again, because it's, uh, there's only text support, it comes out so the null remains, becomes a JSON null, but the number is, is, is a string. It In addition to those functions that return arrays, there are corresponding functions that return sets. So the S keys function returns a, a set or a relation of all the keys in the H store. The S vowels returns a set of all the values. <coughs> and then the each function is really cool. It allows you to iterate over all the keys and values within a single, a single uh, H store. It converts it into a table. So let's talk about the performance. I grabbed a 1998 Amazon review data that uh, Citus DB was nice enough to post in a blog post about some of their column data store stuff. Or maybe it was, no, it's their JSON, they have a JSON foreign data wrapper, which is cool. So that was JSON data. I converted it from the nested JSON data to a flattened H store structure in order to test this stuff. So let's see what it takes to load it up. I created a simple, table with just a single value, uh, excuse me, a single column. That's the HStore data type. And so I copied the reviews that I had flattened and did HStore. Uh, why is that from? Anyway, it took, uh, where's all the time there? I don't know. I calculated it as uh, 68,000 records a second that took to load it. So loading a uh, HDOR was quite fast. Again, it's on this thing, and I think the database fits in memory, but still. So the file was 233 megabytes. I ended up with a 256 megabyte database, so we have around a 10% storage overhead for the HDOR compared to the raw text file. Yeah, the compression people made. Yeah. So uh, again, borrowing from the CITES uh, blog post, I ran this, this funny query here. 
that's basically taking the length of uh, titles of DVD reviews and putting them into buckets based on their length, up to six buckets, in order to see what is the average review score compared to the length of the title of the DVD. So that's what all this crazy stuff is here. Um, but the interesting thing here is reviews, remember, is H store. So I'm saying, so get the product group value, and I'm comparing it to the scalar value here, D, is the DVD. <coughs> so here are the val values. So uh, short titles, the average is 4.27, slightly longer, 4.44. Very boring data. But um, the performance, it took 207 milliseconds. That could be a little better here, because we're basically doing a table scan and comparing all the values. Compared to when we were extracting stuff from the XML, though, this is a lot faster because HStore is stored in a binary representation in the database. It is effectively pre-parsed. So it doesn't have to parse every value. But what's really cool about uh, HStore <laughs> is you can create a GIN index, a general inverted index on it. And this allows you to perform the... Uh, uh, to, uh, more uh, efficiently perform some of these queries. The gin index on HStore, however, is a little slow. <clears throat> you guys want to get coffee? <clears throat> however, when I run a similar query again, so now I'm using the containment operator. So instead of getting product group and casting it to text and saying where it's DVD, now I'm saying where it contains this key that has this value, right? So we get the same results, but now the performance is down to 28 milliseconds which is better. So the database now is 301 megabytes. So we have around 17, 18% overhead for the GIN index. Mr. Berkus. Um, in 9.4, both the index build time and the index size will give up 50% better. I believe I was using the beta for this. Really? OK. Thinks, oh, maybe I did run this test on 9.3. I can't remember now. Okay. <clears throat> However, as with the XML, you can use expression indexes for scalar values. So if we drop the gen index and we create an index uh, on the product group of all the reviews, right, that takes only uh, eight seconds to, to run. So sorry, no coffee for you. <clears throat> The database now is only 268 megabytes, so we have a five, about a 5% overhead for the vTree index on that single value. And the performance, so we're back to doing a uh, comparison and fetching the value. And it's a little better. It was 28 milliseconds before when we were doing the query on the GIN index, and now it's 20. So again, if you know in advance exactly what values you're looking at, you're going to get more efficiency out of a B-tree index. It's slightly more efficient to query, a lot more efficient to build. Tell me to say something. No? Good. So let's talk about dumping HStore. So I did basic value, uh, tests of loading the data and dumping the data as a way to kind of get a, a feel for the I.O. for these different types of data. As I said, HStore has its own internal binary representation, so it must be parsed and formatted as text in order to dump it from the database. So it's kind of the inverse of the XML document problem. However, it is quite fast. And I dumped it here. It took about 3 tenths of a second, 300 milliseconds. So when should you use HStore? Uh, it is a very nice, fast key value store. It has the binary representation that makes looking up individual values much more efficient. The I.O. is a bit slower, so it takes a bit little longer to load and, un and unload. But the operations and the data, once you have it loaded, are much faster. And with gin index support and, of course, uh, expression index support, it's even better. But the utility of HStore is quite limited. There's no nesting of values. As I said, it's just top-level keys and values, strings only. Um, the format is custom. It was inspired by Perl hashes, and yet it is not Perl hashes. There are no nulls in Perl hashes. So it requires parsing. If you need to do something like load it up into your Java application and do something with it as uh, a dictionary, 
you will need to write a parser, although there might be libraries to do that. Any questions about uh, HStore? In the back. Uh, this may be just a little bit too basic of a question, but what's the comparison differences between using HStore columns and using array columns? You know, I probably should have had a section on arrays in here because they are very, very interesting to use as well. Pretty similar, actually. Well, uh, uh, arrays are, is, 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 a, is a list that again has duplicates, and the HStore is a key value store that has no duplicates. If you insert duplicate keys, you will only get one of the keys back, and you won't know which one you get. Um, also, a base or type. Yeah. So is HStore. Well, well oh, so yeah, arrays are typed, right. So, and, well, an HStore is type two, it's just text. <laughs> but it's true, you can have arrays of, of ints, big ints, strings, uh, inet. Yeah, but it doesn't mean you can't make strings. You could, you could have arrays of HStore. Huh? Huh? <laughs> right? Sounds like a wonderful idea. Yeah. <laughs> Let's do it. Make it happen. <laughs> uh, other questions on HStore? Yes? Why is it called HStore? I think it was, again, inspired by the syntax of Perl hashes, so it's like a hash store, I think, I'm guessing. I actually don't know. The, the crazy Russians who wrote it come up with all sorts of fun names. They're working on a new index they're calling vodka. We know why that's called vodka. Yes. And they're Russian. Uh, anything else? H store? H store? H store? All right. So let's talk about JSON. <laughs> yes, sir. Sorry, I just want to get clarification on point about uh, H store. Yes. Now, you say it's the text is binary safe? Can it be used as a blob, or did I misunderstand? No, it's just, you can consider it text, right? But internally, it's stored as binary. So when you insert a J, an HStore value into the database, it's parsed and converted into a binary structure that's in stored in the database. Okay, so that's and what the reason for that is that uh, character set safety and things like that? What's that? That's for like uh, character set safety, stuff like that? No, the, the, the character set stuff is going to be whatever your encoding is in the database. So it doesn't really care about that. It's for fast key lookup. Uh, so, I mean, instead of, I mean, if you think about like a dictionary object or a hash object or something like that, it's sufficient to really look something up by a, a key because it's hashing the key and looking for, for that key in the thing. Whereas if you're doing this with XML and you want to look up something by a key, it has to parse the XML and then load it into a hash. So it's just a way of pre-parsing and pre-structuring um, the data to make operations much, much more efficient. Yes? Would I just also click one series there? So you have a type, say temperature, and it's collected over many years, so you have an H store, which is stored in type stamp as a specific string and a value? Sure. I mean, is, is that an effective post use of post or is there a way to do that? It's just text as far as H store is concerned. So it, it, there's no typing whatsoever in H store beyond that, and null. So whatever you want to put in it. Yeah, Josh. Um, I actually tested that particular use case oh. for the time series database. And um, the problem is that because you're converting the timestamp from the text all the time, right. it ends up being fairly inefficient. It actually was much more efficient for me to store all of the time series as arrays and have nulls for any data points that were missing. Because yeah. a null in an array only takes two bits to store. Oh. Um, so it, it ended up being vastly more efficient to do it that way. We're going to talk about JSON now, but I will say that one of the weaknesses of JSON in my mind is that there is no time, date, time, stamp. Yeah. We need a time series format. to have that for most of us. Somebody should get hacked on that. Yeah. Uh, get, you get your laptop out, you can work on it now. Yeah, okay. Give me until the end of the day. So the JSON support in Postgres was added in Postgres 9.2, which is to say about two years ago. Is that? Oh, okay. It does simple validation on input, and it stores the value as text, just like XML does. 
This was done because we had talked for years about adding JSON support to Postgres, and Robert Haas wrote like the simplest possible thing that could work, which is validate and store. And it got it in there for us. It uses the server text encoding. So even though JSON formally is defined to be UTF-8 because of the lockdown of the encoding of text in, in Postgres, it will actually use the server encoding, whatever that happens to be. But you all use UTF-8 anyway, right? Yeah. Excellent. Because it's storing it as text, it will preserve the key order of the JSON and duplicates, although if you try to look up a value, it's only going to give you the last one that appeared with that key. It will also preserve the white space, if that's important to you. None of these things should be important to you, people. <laughs> yeah. But they are, apparently, in a number of applications. They're important to Berlin. Screw him. Um, in 9.3, so in 9.2, it was just a JSON data type. That was, there were two functions, I think. There were a whole bunch more operators and functions added in Postgres 9.3, thanks to Andrew Dunstan and Heroku, I think, and PGX, of course. And in 9.4, there are new functions for building uh, JSON data types, as we saw kind of for the uh, XML stuff. This stuff actually that was added in 9.3 and 9.4 was available as extensions on PGXN and GitHub prior to 9.4, which m my colleague Michelle can tell you all about sometime. So as with HStore, there's an arrow operator that allows you to get a single value. Unlike with HStore, though, if you pass it an integer, it's assuming you're doing an array key index lookup. Arrays in JSON, of course, start with 0, so we're getting the third array here, which is C with Boz. Of course, you can also pass it a string, and it'll do a key lookup. So here I'm getting A, which is returning this uh, object. But note that it's returning it, in, in, in both these cases, it's returning a JSON type value. If you want text for a particular value, use this double arrow operator, and it'll return the text value, the text uh, equivalent of that value, which is great. Even if it's a number, if you know it's a number, you can then cast it to numeric to integer or whatever. There is a path lookup operator. So we don't support like JSON path or anything like that in Postgres because we have a way of expressing a path already and it's an array. So you pass a, a text array here. So I'm saying under the A key, there's an object that has a B key and so I want the value there. So I'm going to A key with the B key, which is this thing here and it returns the JSON value. Again, you can do the double arrow here and you'll get back the text expression. So here I'm saying under A, I want the second value. So A is an array and the third, excuse me, the third value is three. So that's what I get. Similar to HStore, there are a number of constructors you can use. You can cast uh, a scalar value to JSON. So uh, scalar text, string, and numeric, null, and Boolean values are all supported as JSON here. So you can see here it's got the quotes and the, backs, the escape stuff here. That's because it's, that's a JSON text string. You can, of course, also uh, pass composites, and it will cast those using the column names as the keys. And uh, of course, if you're, you can, spe you can, it, you can uh, where the data types are equivalent, the value will be preserved. So a, an integer is preserved as a number, a Boolean is preserved as a J JSON Boolean, a null becomes a JSON null, and a string, of course, becomes a JSON string. You can uh, also now, as of 9.4, coming soon, build an array of values. And of course, you can pass different types of values. Uh, and they, in most functions in Postgres, you have to pass things of it when, it, when it's a, um, when you can pass any number of uh, values, they all have to see the same type. But this one, you can pass different types and the data type will come out properly in the resulting JSON. You can build an object, and again, the same is true. Uh, key foo with a value one, key bar with a value true, and we get the JSON. And if you use a number as a key in there, you'll get an array? 
If you use a number as a key in there, it will be, I believe, turned into a string. Ah, okay. Because in JSON, keys are strings only. Oh, you've got to build array. So, yeah. yeah. Uh, so I'm, here I'm building an object, and we can do nesting. So I'm building an object with the key foo with the value 1, and the key bar it has a value of an array that has a 1, a 2, and a, the text 3. And you get the nested JSON. Nice, right? Similar to the uh, hstore each function, we have a JSON each function that will return the key value pairs for the JSON object. Now, the value is going to be a JSON string, which is why you see the double quotes here. You can also use JSON each text in order to get back the values as text instead. But this can be useful if you have nesting, right? You might want to get back nested JSON as the values. Other JSONs, you can get the length of an array in JSON. If you pass it an object, it's going to give you an error. <coughs> you can get uh, a list. I can't remember if this is a list or uh, an array of keys in the JSON. If you pass it an array, you're going to get an error. This, I believe, returns, and I think these return sets, actually. So I believe this returns a set of all the elements in an, ar in a, in an array, <coughs> which will be JSON values. And you can get them back as text as well. A JSON type of will tell you the type of a JSON value, which is going to be string, null, boolean, uh, object, or array. Right? And there's lots more stuff. So I wrote, loaded the same uh, Amazon review data that Citus provided in their blog post which is JSON, and it's nested JSON, which made it a little easier to load than it did as HStore. So again, I created a table called reviews with a single value, a single column of the type JSON, and loaded the data up. So this took about, it was quite fast to load, 86,000 records a second. Remember, it was about 70,000 rec 70, records a second, 68,000 for the HStore. The reason this is faster is because it's validating the JSON, but then just storing it as text. It's not converting it to an internal representation. So it's going to be more efficient. The data file was 208 megabytes, and the resulting database is 240 megabytes, so you have about a 15% storage overhead. With HStore, it was about 10. Again, Josh says that was because with HStore, the compression was kicking in. Depending on how well your JSON compresses, you'll get more or less uh, storage overhead. So over, overall, it's much faster than HStore, but you get a slightly more overhead, at least with this data set. So I wanted to run the same type of query that I did with the HStore example. Here I'm doing a path lookup. So I'm using the, the path to text operator. So I'm passing it the path. So product and group is DVD. And the performance here is 17 and a half seconds. I think it was closer to 40 with the HStore. Is that right? <coughs> After the, I indexed it. I can't remember now. I should have the, those values in there. So, op, yeah, it was faster with HStore. That's right. So overall, operations on JSON values are slower than with HStore. Again, because every time you're calling a function or applying an operator to a JSON value, the JSON value has to be parsed into some other representation in order to do the comparisons. And on JSON, there's no gin or gist index. There's no equivalence operator. There are no B-tree indexes, none of that stuff. However, as with XML, you can use an expression index. So if I just take the uh, bit I was doing before for the review uh, where I'm indexing the product group, which is always the scalar value in this data set. When I run the query again, and here I'm using the same stuff, we're down to just 91 milliseconds. So expression indexes, again, big win if you know in advance exactly the sorts of things you need to look up in your data set. Now, as I said, JSON is stored internally as text. There is no parsing on output. 
So dumping is quite a bit faster than HStore because HStore has its internal binary representation that has to be converted to text when you dump it. So here uh, it took 220 milliseconds. And it was around 300 milliseconds for the HStore. So when should you use JSON? When you have JSON documents that you need to store and, you need, or, and or if you need to preserve duplicates, duplicate keys in your JSON objects, or you need to preserve the order of the keys that appear in your JSON documents, or if you need to preserve the white space in your documents, don't do that. Uh, the storage is excellent for JSON because it's stored as text and the I.O. is very fast. And the operations on it, the operators are great, really great operators and functions. Fetch the keys and paths, but of course, again, the performance of those operations is going to be best on index scalar values. Or when a table scan happens to be okay, maybe you don't have a whole lot of data. But remember, um, the, reason, the reason it's uh, relatively slow to use these operations is you have a per row, or actually I should say per value, parsing overhead for each JSON value. So questions about JSON? Yes, sir. Uh, can you produce uh, JSON uh, from an uh, SQL statement like you did with XML? Yeah, with uh, th that's one of the uh, things that was shown there. There's the build JSON object and build JSON array functions, uh -huh. and you can nest those. Okay. Mm -hmm. Other questions? What was the um, I, I sorry, I don't remember the thread. We had a thread from '94, I think it was, where we were going to do some JSON improvements. Did those make it in? They did. They did. Okay. That's what the JSON build stuff is, uh, which was available as an extension previously. But this, if, this should all sound familiar because this is almost exactly the same stuff that was on the XML slide. All right, I'm going to move on to JSONB so we don't run out of time. It's hard to find quotes about JSONB because it doesn't exist yet. So JSONB is a new data type that's being introduced in Postgres 9.4 sometime this month, maybe. Bug Josh about it. Like the JSON data type, it is a full JSON data type implementation. He's a server encoding. It was inspired by the HStore2 project, which was a project the crazy Russians, Oleg and Teodor, carried out to create a new HStore type that looked almost exactly like JSON, but wasn't. Like HStore, though, and unlike the JSON data type, it uses binary storage, which means that you have HStore style query operators you can run against it. But because it's parsed and stored in its internal representation, there is no key order or duplicate preservation or white space preservation outside of string values, of course. But the operations are much faster, again, like HStore. And it supports GIN indexing. So let's look at some of the operators. They're all the JSON operators we already talked about. They're all supported for JSONB. There's, of course, a lot of overlap. But unlike JSON, there, the JSONB type has an equivalence operator. Now note here I have A and then B, and here I have B and then A. But because they have the same keys with the same values, they are in fact equivalent, as God intended. <laughs> <laughs> There's also, like HDOR, a containment operator. Does this value contain this, this value? And again, we're saying, does it have a B key with a value of 2? So it's not just the key, but also the value. And there's the existence function. Does that containment operator have a name? Containment operator. We can't, can we call it ice cream cone? Ice cream cone. That works for me. I, I think it maybe should be like drippy ice cream cone. <laughs> the ice cream cone operator. I like it. It's the soft serve operator. <laughs> I snorted, Jesus. Uh, and of course, the uh, existence operator, will, which will tell you if a key exists. 
in there. There are also nested versions, right? So we have a nested array here. And so equivalence, of course, still works for the nested array. Of course, the order of the keys matters. Uh, again, with the containment, the ice cream operator, ice cream cone operator, I'm saying, is there an A key which has an object that has a C key which has a three? And yes, that's, that's true here. So we have nesting all the way down that includes values, not just keys. When you're doing the ice cream operator against an JSON B array, of course you're saying, this area array does it contain these values? The order in the array doesn't, doesn't matter. So I'm saying, is there three, one? There's one, two, three in here. It has both three and one, therefore it's true. Then we have, uh, does, do any of these values exist in here? Does this uh, JSON B value have a B or a D? And it does, so it returns true. Or does it have both an A and a B key? Let's look at the performance. Again, I created a new table this time, just like before, only JSON B instead of JSON. And I loaded it up. This was a little slower, about 60,000 records a second. 200, same 208 megabyte copy file, 277 megabyte database. So we have a 32.9% overhead, storage overhead. Now, what was discovered about a month ago is that the reason this is so high is because JSONB does not compress very well on disk at all. It, the way it is structured internally in its binary structure, uh, the toast compression algorithm doesn't think it's that compressible. This is actually a problem that is holding up the 9.4 release because they're trying to figure out whether to make it compress more to bring this overhead down, but then to make other things slower or to leave it and let the operations continue to be fast, but the IO is slower. So if you have opinions, um, talk to Josh after the presentation. Uh, and again, it's slower, slower than JSON, which was the very fast. Now again, that's because we have the parsing overhead. And it's uh, more complicated than the HStore one was, which was quite a bit faster than this, because uh, we have nested data types, whereas HStore was completely flat. Uh, and it's bigger. We have a 15%, uh, a JSON had a 15% overhead. Again, depending on what we decided to do with compression, uh, this might get better. So running the same query I did before uh, using the uh, path operator here, product group to DVD, it took 381 milliseconds. With JSON, it took 1,765 milliseconds. And with HStore, it took 207 milliseconds. So performance is much closer to HStore. And again, this is because the values are already parsed. And therefore, you don't you eliminate that overhead. Now, as I said, JSONB supports inverted indexes, which supports the, the ice cream cone operator and the question mark operators. So all we have to do is create the gin index here. So you see here it takes a, a little over 20 seconds. This is 10 times faster than the same index was on HStore. I have no idea why. You don't even have time to get coffee with this one. Did I make, I don't think, I, I think I did a gin index with the HStore too, not just but just should be faster. But this, this surprised me. This might also be because I might have been testing HStore on N3, and there are massive GIN index creation improvements in 9.4. And that would help HStore too. So the database size is now 341 megabytes, so we have a 23% overhead for the GIN index. It was a much lower overhead for HStore. Again, I think that's because uh, HStore are flat. Yeah. So uh, using the containment, the ice cream's cone operator, to execute the query, we now bring the performance down to just 35 milliseconds. Now, here's the secret weapon with JSONB GIN operator, or GIN indexes. There's a special GIN uh, op, Operate, pa, uh, group of operators called JSON B Path Ops. We didn't change that name, did we, Josh? JSON B Path. I think that's what we ended up calling it. Yeah. 
So what, if we use this, it tell, do we get only one index entry per path, whereas before it had to have a much more complicated structure to support the question mark operators. So if I drop this index, uh, the previous index, and I create it again uh, using the JSONB path ops, we cut the creation of the gen index in half, right? So now the database size, is, now we have only a 16.5% overhead for the database, or excuse me, for the index. And this is almost the same as what we had for HStore, which was flat. So it's essentially kind of flattening the, uh, the index. The, the upshot is that JSONB path ops works only with the containment operator, does not work with the, question, the existence operators. Without ops, you can, it'll support the existence operators. But if you're only using the ice cream cone operator, then we get it down. Uh, the performance is about the same here, but the uh, maintenance of the index itself is much more efficient, and the um, size of the index is, is much more reasonable. And I think the performance can actually be better, too. I'm not sure why it wasn't here. Now, for dumping, again, we have an internally, it has a binary representation that must be parsed on output. So it's quite a bit slower than HStore, uh, which I found interesting because HStore is also a binary. But again, I think it's because this is nested and HStore is flat. So when should you use JSONB? Well, obviously, only when you're on 9.4. Is anybody using 9.4 in production? You're nuts, man. <laughs> uh, when you don't care about preserving duplicates in your JSON or preserving the order of keys or preserving white space, it has great object storage with the binary representation, very efficient operators. All the operations are awesome. If you need to fetch keys or paths, or you want to use a gin index for, con the con especially if you're doing containment operations on it. You can also use expression indexes. You can even use expression indexes with gin. So if you only have a particular value or set of values, you can limit the indexing to just those when you're creating your gin index. The I.O., however, is slower. Um, and depending on what happens with the compression, it might, that might change for the, for the worse. I'm not even sure. So let's review quickly because I'm running out of time. So XML, once you use XML, only when you have no other choice. Once you use HStore, when a flat structure is OK for you, and the limitation to only string values is OK for you, but then you get the advantage of the fast operations. Once you use JSON, when you have JSON documents you need to store, and you need to preserve the keys, or the order of the keys, or the white space. And when you should use JSON B is for everything else. On 9.4, of course. So that's my uh, overall advice, or, or was as of a few months ago. I don't expect it to change. For the most part, JSON B gets us almost all the advantages that we'd want to get out of structured data type. Almost. So, any other questions in the remaining 30 seconds? Min uh, 60 seconds. Lull y'all on the silence. Yes, Josh. Can I ask the JSONB trade-off question? What's that? Can I ask the JSONB trade-off question here? Or yeah, yeah, yeah. No, actually, this would be a great venue for it. Yeah. Um, what's the difference between the JSONB and the JSONB trade-off question? Yeah. Uh, well, actually, this would be a great venue for it. So. How many of you would have reason to use JSONB once 9.4 comes out? Okay. So the trade-off that we're currently facing with JSONB is that we can restructure the data type to make it compress better. And by better, I mean in worst cases of the difference, in the most dramatic case of the difference, a 60% size reduction. So like for a particular data set I was dealing with, um, I, you know, 400 gigabytes versus a terabyte. Um, the, um, I, in less dramatic cases, the difference is much smaller. Um, but for those same cases, um, that also increases extraction times, um, both because of some changes to the data structure and because of obviously decompression time. Are you talking about like dumping or also operations on like path hookups? Well, not if you have an index, there is no change right. in the speed of path lookups. Right. 
Um, if you don't have an index, then there is a change because you have yeah. to extract before you can look up the path. Right. Um, so again, worst case scenario for extraction times, 80% increase in query times. So if it was 30 milliseconds before, it becomes 50 milliseconds now. Um, so keeping in mind that size is also performance because that can often make the difference of does it fit in memory or not. Yeah, I am. How do people feel about that trade-off, thinking about your particular use case? Actually, here's a good question. For everybody who raised your hands, um, how many of you would have a JSON structure that would be likely to have more than 100 top-level keys? Anybody? Yes, yeah, so we've got a few people who've got more than, because that's our worst case, is when you have a lot of top-level keys. Mm -hmm. How many of you would be likely to have data that would have very large values, like sentences or blocks of text? It was a lot of the same people. And that takes you out of the worst case, because those large blocks of text compress pretty well. Right. Um, the, um, okay. So, and even for the rest of you, if you had to make that trade off, you know, of saying, okay, it's going to store much more compactly, but it's going to take a little bit longer to do, not, not row lookup, but to do extraction, to actually get the values out of it. Um, how many people would prefer the smaller size? On disk? On disk, yeah. the smaller on disk and in memory size. And how many people would prefer the faster extraction even if it meant the database was much larger? Well, that's an even split. Yeah. <laughs> See, this is why we have not been able to decide this. Well, I, yeah. I yeah. I mean, you and I deal with this a lot. But, um, one of the benefits, obviously, of the smaller the size is the ability to possibly have the cache. Yeah. Um, and that's actually, at least for my customer base, that's the number one thing we're running into now with performance is we're getting data sets that don't fit in cache anymore. Right. A lot, I mean, all the time. And yeah. people are running, you know, 8 or 16 gig machines that really need to be 64, 128 gig machines. Yeah. So the, uh, well, even higher. See, based on that, I mean, if we're talking about it being in cache, are we really going to notice the difference in extraction once it's in cache? You no, know, that is what you notice, because it's CPU time is the difference in extraction, is it's all CPU time. So, so in the cases of if your database doesn't fit in cache, then the difference in extraction time gets overshadowed by the difference in read right, time. Right, right. Um, but if your database does fit in cache, it's the other way around. 